I've never been a fan of watching the news. Usually, if the news anchors aren't being overly dramatic about the weather or sports, they're reporting on depressing things like car crashes, animal abuse, child abuse. I find none of this entertaining and typically flip the channel to an episode of South Park. Just, just recently, a news report caught my attention during a ritual of channel surfing. If the anchorman hadn't phrased it just right, I probably wouldn't be alive right now. I caught the tail end of a news segment before the commercial break, and the anchorman, Ross Cooper, said, Coming up, find out what local residents are starting to call a miracle. Our own Dan Aaron reports live on a slowly growing phenomenon happening in our city right after the break. Stay tuned. A line like that was enough to keep me hooked. So I chose to sit through the seemingly endless string of commercials. As usual, you had your movie trailers, store advertisements, and those drug commercials that always show people frolicking in the meadows while a narrator lists all the unpleasant side effects. Commercials always last too long, but I feel it's worth it if listening to this particular exciting news story. When the news returned, the face of Ross Cooper looked very worried as he reported that there was a breaking news story and reporter Dan Aaron was on the scene. The camera cut to Dan standing inside a darkened home with several other people peering outside a window. It's impossible to see what was happening outside, but shouts and screaming could be heard in the background. I'm reporting from a home deep in the heart of Los Angeles where other survivors have taken refuge. The miracle that people have been talking about is false. To everyone in the area watching this report, do not go outside. If you hear people calling your name, do not listen to them. Dan started, looking both panicked and nearly ready to break out into tears. Showing concern, Ross asked him exactly what was going on. Earlier today, there was a giant flash of light that looked like a portal was opening up from the sky, and then these things came through. I, I don't know what they are, but they're not human, and they intend to kill us all. Extermination has already begun. Dan shrieked, trying his best to keep his cool on live TV. Something inside of me said it was a prank, but I I had to keep watching. Now, now, now calm down, Dan. How can you describe these attackers to our viewers? Ross asked, staying professional. Well, a young man in our group described them as shapeshifters. I believe that's, a, that's an accurate description. None of us here have seen their true form, but they're... they're Appearance seems to change multiple times, completely at random. And when one of these things looks at you, it, it, it's like it can see into your mind. See, all, all the thoughts and, and the family members, and, and it uses that against you. These beings will take the form of all your friends, your loved ones, even, even those that have passed on. They'll, they'll mimic their speech exactly how you remember it, and they'll, they'll beckon you to come outside with them. That's how they get you. See, when their victims die, they, their bodies just vaporize. They vaporize from this eerie light that shines from their eyes and their mouth, and, and you hear what they really sound like, and it's horrible. I, I've seen so many people die today, Ross, and it, there, there's nothing left of them. Dan had completely lost his mind. He was trembling. He was sobbing into the camera. Dan, do you feel safe where you are right now? Ross asked. I don't know! Dan snapped back, his sadness turning into rage suddenly. The group that I'm with has guns and the, the doors are bolted, but we have no idea what these beings are capable of. I don't know if they're aliens or demons, but, but their numbers are growing by the minute and I think LA will soon be overrun. Everyone with me is in a bad mental state right now. We, we can hear our loved ones calling to us, begging us to go out and see them. I, I just saw, I just saw my great grandmother moments ago. And I want to run to her, but I can't. It seems like the end times, and I'm sure things, this is, this is happening, this is happening elsewhere. The human race may be wiped out, but if, if we could just hang on and not let our emotions cloud our judgment, we might survive long enough for help to arrive. Call the military. Call, call everyone you can. We, we can't let these creatures win. The signal started to die. The last thing I remember him saying was, oh God. I, I think a few got inside before he faded out and a shocked Ross Cooper announced that his station would be going off the air. 
An emergency broadcast signal started seconds later, and I just sat there on the couch in silence. I didn't know if I should call everyone I knew, or wait and see if this epidemic would even affect my area. I felt the sudden need to look outside, and just as I did so, I saw, of all the people, my old gym teacher, Mr. Moores, who had mentored me and helped me become the athlete that I am today, he, he called to me, reminding me how long it had been since we last spoke. Of course, I knew it wasn't really him. Had I not watched the news report when I did, I would have gone out to talk to him, only to meet an, an, an agonizing death. Behind him, approaching from a distance, was a mob of these invaders that were marching through my neighborhood. And that's the last time I glanced outside. Now I sit locked in a dark basement with only the glow of my computer screen. All the doors to my house are locked and all the lights that would attract attention are out. I think the mobs bypassed my house as I, I can't hear anyone else calling my name. I've just heard screams of terror from my other neighbors. And I think they're dead. It's very quiet now. I've already warned everyone I can think of to stay indoors. I'm sure I'll think of more people as the night goes on. But for now, I'm just... I'm going to focus on getting the story out. I mean, I think... I think the military will act. I'm, I'm sure they'll be here any minute to get whatever this is under control. But if not, I have enough supplies to hopefully last a month or two at the most. After doing constant research online, I'm certain this... It's, it's a global phenomenon. Videos are starting to appear on YouTube shot by people who have barricaded themselves in either their homes or public spaces, and these videos feature footage of mobs, mobs like the one that I just saw not long ago. One particular video came from far, far away, from, from Tokyo, Japan. The video's already had over a million views, and in the comment section, several people have claimed to have seen their own relatives in the mob that was filmed by a man from this 40th floor of his apartment building. You know, I checked it out for myself, sure enough. All the way from Japan, I saw my grandfather, my uncle, my stepmom marching through the streets. They seemed to be staring right at me through the computer screen. Videos like these, they're, they're proof that we're now dealing with a force far beyond our understanding. What, what exactly are they? How did they get here? Hopefully we can survive long enough to find those answers. If, if I make it through the night, I promise to constantly update my tale of these catastrophic events. My name is Reagan Myers. Los Angeles, California, and I'm a witness. A witness to the beginning of a new era. This is Private Blake Aaron of the U.S. Special Forces. I'm stationed outside the city of Los Angeles with what is left of my original squad, and I'm recording the events that I uh, just witnessed in the hopes that someone finds these reports if we don't make it out of here. This report itself would be dedicated to my fallen comrades and my, my big brother, Dan Aaron, who I suspect is dead. Dan was a news reporter, doing a story on the very event I'm going to talk about before he was attacked. We're dealing with dangerous beings that possess power no military force should have been prepared for, because, because well, they're not of this world. The information on these attackers is said to be classified, let's face it. Nobody knows what the fuck they are. My experience started after my team was scrambled at sundown and sent to L.A. after a supposed riot breakout. And we were, we were to take control. See, a large SWAT team had been sent in before us, and these rioters were overwhelmed. It was our job to save the day. We expected to get the situation under control in no time. When we arrived at the scene by nightfall, the whole place had already begun tr transforming into a, a chaotic battleground, after only a few hours, buildings and cars were on fire. There was barely anything left of the SWAT team, and there were tons of citizens out on the street yelling and screaming. Our first instincts told us to get these people to safety. So we tried to establish order, but we soon found out that the people on the streets were actually our enemies. My squad and I, we all of a sudden started to hear shouting from people who had, who had barricaded themselves into the nearby buildings. And we realized they were warnings. 
saying that the seemingly ordinary people outside were evil and that we shouldn't engage them. As you can imagine, this caused a lot of confusion, but that's when we looked around and noticed the remains of the squad that went in before us. It had been a riot control team, riot shields, helmets, pieces of body armor littering the streets. It's a massive force had to have done this, and the only suspects around were harmless-looking citizens. We all thought that we'd show up on the scene, guns blazing. We just... We, we just stood there. No plan. Suddenly, shots fired into the crowd from, the, from three surviving squad members that had been hiding behind an overturned van. And since they were on riot control, the bullets in their guns were rubber, so the crowd wasn't too affected. And then I saw a frail old woman walk up to the three troopers and open her mouth and and she let out the worst noise I'd ever heard, followed by a blast of energy that shot out of her body and reduced them to ash. Our team leader, Frank Hobson, he gave the command to open fire before he too was vaporized by another member of the crowd. I, I held down the trigger on my gun and instinctively grabbed the riot shield as I ran forward for cover. A more blast of energy came my way. Four more members of my squad were gone in seconds, and the rest of us took cover behind wrecked vehicles of all kinds. Toby Gearhart, my, my squad's second in command, immediately radioed for backup and emphasized that tanks and helicopters were needed. The rest of us took shots at the crowd, and although some of them were going down, it, it, it didn't seem to do much good because more of them were coming from a... a, a portal of some kind one that had opened up far off in the distance. To make matters worse, the ones that had been shot started to get back up, and although it was hard to see through all the smoke from the nearby fires, they, they didn't seem to have any bullet wounds. I... That's right, yeah, you heard me correctly. These living weapons came from a portal that just opened up without warning. They're... That's the only way I can describe the phenomenon. The eerie light that shoots out of their eyes and mouth would be astonishing if it wasn't so terrifying. It's a very interesting method of attack and simply should not be possible. What's even more interesting is their appearance as human beings, and they, they must have been studying us for a very long time to mimic us so well. There's another thing about their appearance that's even harder to believe. I was blindly shooting at these things, pointing my gun through the car windows that I was hiding behind, and then I decided to look up over the car, and that's when I saw the face. It was the face of my wife, Alyssa Aaron. The woman I've been married to for six years was standing amongst the crowd of invaders, screaming my name, crying with joy. I, I, I released the trigger, and, I, and so did two others when they saw people they recognized in the crowd. Her presence in the battle zone was impossible, but for some reason my mind didn't even question it. The urge to drop my gun and run over to her was almost too much to resist. I would have given in to this urge if I hadn't noticed that the faces of the other people were constantly changing depending on who they were looking at. It then became all too clear that their plan was to beat us by getting into our minds, playing with our emotions through shape-shifting. I remember calling out to trick, they're not our loved ones, to my comrades, but before putting a hole in my wife's head, who just returned fire in my direction moments later. Despite this, some of my comrades still refused to fight, one of them being none other than Toby himself, the toughest badass I'd ever, I'd ever known, who surpassed me in every military training session I could think of. The guy literally stood up, dropped his gun, and abandoned us because his emotions would no longer allow him to shoot at people. People that looked like those that he cared about. With two of our leaders gone, I volunteered to become the new team lead, even though I knew we'd be fighting a losing battle. I ordered my men to fall back. By doing so, I could only get them to a safer place, but I... I was expecting the evil crowd to follow us, so all the people hiding in their buildings would sneak out and possibly escape the city. My plan seemed to work, but that also meant that we would be running like hell as energy blasts were fired at us. Those things began to chase us down the street, they made horrible screeching noises as they did so, which were unbearable to listen to. One team member couldn't stand the noise any longer. He covered his ears, fell to his knees, making him an easy target who was killed quickly. The man's name was Gerald, youngest of the group who had very recently added to my squad. 
Seeing his skin burn away and bone disintegrate made me think just, just how hopeless our struggle was. All I could do was continue to flee from my life, not knowing how many of our teammates were still with me. We briefly hid behind a diner to return fire, and as I shot at the killers some more, I gazed further back past the crowd to see a group of survivors leaving their buildings, running to safety. A couple of them, however, they were, they were not so lucky, as they fell for the same trick I almost did. Several beams of that eerie light shot the diner, setting it ablaze, so I gave the orders to keep moving as the armies of strange beings hunted us. We ran down the doomed streets as fast as our legs could carry us, and nearly got ran over by some vehicles heading far away from Los Angeles. It was already around that time that we had heard the buzzing of helicopters and the rumbling of several tanks that were headed our way. Once the tanks became more visible, we ran into the nearest alleyway out of their line of fire. One chopper flew over our heads, shining a light down on us, then landed away from where the invaders were. There was nothing more we could do. We had, just, we had to board the helicopter and leave. We ran for the chopper. We heard loud booms behind us that shook the ground hard. And once we were in the air, I caught a glimpse of the battle scene that I'd never forget. Dozens of invaders blasting a tank all at once, causing it to melt. The other tanks firing many shots that sent enemies flying back. Bullets rained down upon them from the other helicopters. I never got to see if those that were hit stood back up, but I'm sure at least some of them are finally dead, assuming they're, they're able to die. The view from the chopper of the dark city below was haunting to say the least. Nearly all the lights were out of every building, only the glowing of the fires to illuminate it. An evacuation was underway, and all exits leading away from the city were clogged with, with cars. Our pilot reported back to base that he could spot more armies of the invaders marching towards the nearby neighborhoods. There were other teams standing by to help with evacuation, and we would need all the help available to us to get citizens far away from the extermination squads. Ones that were at full force. We were flown to a camp that had recently been set up in an area overlooking the city. Plenty of vantage points in case our enemies tried a sneak attack. This camp is where I'll be sleeping tonight. I, I've been told to stay put. Wait for further instructions from the people now in charge. The boys and I, we set one TV up and I've been watching reports from newscasters on this disaster from literally all over the world. And I shit you not. It's on one of those reports that I heard my brother's last words. One of those things got into the building where he was hiding, and from experience, I know you can't survive if they get too close. It's something I've been trying to talk to people about, but I don't think they'll listen to me. So I'll just put it down right now. I know what these beings really look like. When one of them invades your mind and tries to make you lower your defenses, you, you get brief flashes of their true face. It must be like your minds are becoming one. Their skin is this metallic silver shine. Their eyes are large and diamond-shaped. They have razor-sharp teeth, no senses. The weirdest part of them is their eyes because they're vertical. And that image will never leave my memory. I must say, there's something very strange about the people we're taking orders from. The first thing before that, they, they don't seem to be with the military. There's troops marching around with black armor like, like Darth Vader. They won't even make eye contact with me. Someone keeps radioing in about what sounds like an unsuccessful attempt at capturing one of those invaders. So far, I've at least been able to talk to Agent Matthews, the person who seems to be running this operation. He informed me that my men and I were relieved of our duties for the time being. But to stand by anyway. Agent Matthews is a shady character. I get the feeling that he knows something the rest of us don't. There's an odd calmness about him, even though we're at the brink of an apocalypse. He and his men were quick to respond, almost as if they knew these invaders were coming. And that makes me ask more questions. But I know that that'll all be frowned upon. I'm not here to have questions answered. I'm here to fight when told to because I'm, I'm just a grunt. Although because of my recent actions... There's talk that my status as Special Forces Operative might be changed soon. It doesn't matter. Not after the mass exterminations of humans everywhere. One thing I will mention about Matthews, he's constantly on his cell phone with someone he keeps referring to as Master. Now, I've been in the military for a long time. I haven't heard the word Master uttered as a military term. And obviously, that's someone far up the chain who put this operation in Matthews' hands. And 
you know, to fuck it up would lead to a harsh punishment. The only time the guy ever seems to get anxious is when he's on the phone receiving orders. Maybe someday I'll actually get to meet this mysterious person. But I'd sure like to know who I'm fighting for. You can bet I'll be sleeping with a gun tonight. Even though I have that feeling that I'll wake up dead. Whatever traveled to our planet's here to stay. It won't be easy to stop them when they already know all of our weaknesses. But if I don't make it through this nightmare, and someone happens to stumble upon this report, then please find a way to let my wife, Alyssa, and my son, Colton, know that I fought, I fought my damn hardest. To save what's left in this world. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode, This October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify, or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube, or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. I just want to remind all of you that if you're on a cold autumn night and you need a warm drink, that my wife sells tea. There's tea available at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. All different kinds, including those themed off of creepypastas, horror icons, horror monsters, and Dungeons and & Dragons. And if you order that creepypasta set with the Mr. Creepypasta's Dark and Stormy Night, the actual tea that I drink while recording these stories, uh, well, probably about 60% of the time, then you can always ask for that MCP dabbing sticker instead of the classic channel icon sticker. And I get a kick out of it every time someone asks her to do that. Also, I wanted to say thank you all of you who are supporting me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Champinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krause, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charan, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderfully happy Halloween. Sweet dreams. <laughs>